Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. You're watching News Umami Hosuma Khalid. But today is the 15th of December 2021. 15 days left till the end of the year. Nevertheless, a lot of stories to discuss during the course of the show. We will begin with Pakistan that, that has sent another consignment of relief goods to Afghanistan as part of its efforts to ward off the looming economic and humanitarian crisis that is slowly and steadily engulfing Afghanistan. Pakistan has been calling to the entire world to help Afghanistan before it is too late. We are also holding a special conference of the OIC on the 19th of this month for this exact matter. The world needs to wake up and the world needs to do something before it's too late. Pakistan nevertheless is doing whatever it can. This is going to be our first segment. Our second story, ladies and gentlemen, concerns uh, the market expectations, the economy of Pakistan, the uh, central account deficit, the inflation rate that uh, uh, will remain the same as per the State Bank of Pakistan remain increased, so will the current account deficit despite the increase in the interest rate to 20%. What uh, uh, and how is the country going to move forward in the next couple of months as far as our economy is concerned, despite the measure that have been taken by the Central Bank of Pakistan, this is going to be our second story of the day. Then we'll be talking about a Sri Lankan cricketer turned politician, Arjuna Ranatunga, who has thanked Prime Minister Imran Khan uh, for his efforts to find all those involved in the lynching of a Sri Lankan man Siakur earlier this month and his support for the deceased family. We will remember and we should remember that uh, Priyantha Kumara, who was a 49-year-old factory manager uh, from Sri Lanka, was lynched by a mob uh, that belonged to hundreds of protesters. Nevertheless, the country has taken the necessary measures and has arrested hundreds of them and has launched cases against them. Then we'll be talking about China that has detected its uh, second case of the Omicron variant in a traveler more than two weeks after he arrived in China from abroad. Omicron is slowly and steadily uh, raising its head across the world, including China, including many other countries, the United Kingdom, as an example, where the number of cases increasing per day. Uh, whereas, on the one hand, uh, the people say it's not as virulent or as uh, intensive or aggressive as is the Delta variant. Nevertheless, it is uh, being spread at a very, very quick rate. And we need to ascertain, uh, even now, whether it uh, will be as aggressive either as its predecessors, because the number of cases for the moment is not as much as were the previous cases. So let's see how it all happens. Nevertheless, a lot of concern across the world as far as Omicron is concerned. Then we'll be talking about uh, Republican Representative Lauren Boebert, who cracked a racist Islamophobic joke about Democratic Representative uh, Ilhan Umar in the U.S. House of Representatives. As a result, uh, the, uh, the House has on Tuesday taken a first formal step as a response uh, by voting to approve legislation sponsored by Umar that would establish a new special envoy position at the State Department to monitor and combat Islamophobia worldwide. This is a very important measure, especially coming from a country like the United States of America. Whether it be passed by the Senate or not, only time will tell. Let's start with our first segment, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first story of the day, and that concerns uh, the aid to Afghanistan that Pakistan has been regularly sending, and also the pledge that Pakistan has been making to the entire world to help uh, Afghanistan before it is too late. More in the following report. In the aftermath of U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, an imminent humanitarian crisis is on the horizon that needs international communities' attention. U.N. agencies have also been red-flagging Afghanistan's catastrophic situation. According to U.N.'s World Food Program, a failing economy could tip Afghanistan's increasingly dire situation into catastrophe by next year. In a bid to bring world communities' attention to Afghanistan humanitarian crisis, Islamabad is set to host the OIC Conference of Foreign Ministers to avert a looming humanitarian and economic crisis in Afghanistan. Pakistan's Foreign Minister Shah Mehmood Qureshi said that the conference would be an opportunity for the Afghan interim government to remove world's apprehensions. The conference has one point agenda, focusing on the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. As part of its attempts to avert a humanitarian crisis in the war torn country, another car cargo of humanitarian aid by Pakistan was dispatched to Afghanistan comprising 1,722 tons of food, medicines and shelters for distressed Afghan brethren. Now to discuss aid to Afghanistan, the importance in this day for our neighbouring country. We've been joined by Dr. Farah Naz, who is not only a foreign affairs expert, but also an assistant professor at the Nast University. Dr. Sahiba, thank you very much to have uh, joined us. 
aid to Afghanistan, humanitarian, economic, how important is it? Uh, I think the first thing is that why Afghanistan need an aid to uh, to support its population? Because now the issue is between survival and governance. Where the world is focusing more on the governance side, but they are not primarily looking at the survival aspects of the 38 to 39 million population. So recently, I have learned from Ambassador Sadiq the economic situation in Afgan of Afghanistan, which is really, really worrisome. And um, I think the world needs to sensitize itself towards the actual catastrophe that's happening in Afghanistan. So I have found that the foreign, so far, like when the, uh, the democratic system was in place in Afghanistan, uh, its economy was entirely based on foreign assistance and grants. They never enabled the economic situation in Afghanistan to stand in its own feet. And I think that was by design. So once they leave, they have to concentrate on the uh, outside sources. There's a lot of echo uh, Umar going on, so I'm, I'm not able to pay attention to what you're saying. All right. Now, Dr. Faranaz, what I want to ask you is that in this whole scenario, and of course, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the statements uh, saying that over one million children in Afghanistan are faced with food scarcity and other problems, the United Nations have yeah. be, has been asked to help uh, Afghanistan before it's too late. How important? is a coordinated global response it's very much coordinated it's, it's required there uh, but the thing is that we have to see what sort of assistance is available to them and what sort of assistance is not available to them so if the foreign assistance even stop 30 percent of shrinkage will be there right so they need to have the foreign assistance foreign aid to be supplied to them as soon as possible if it is supplies despite that 28 percent shrinkage is going to be witnessed at the moment it says that 45 percent of afghan gdp was based on foreign grants right 75 percent of public spend spending was based on foreign assistance by the time when democracy was in place 50% of its budget was based on foreign assistance. 90% of the defense was based on grants. So it was the entire mechanism of Afghanistan was based on foreign assistance, foreign funds, foreign transfers. So what, like once and for all, when things were taken off Afghanistan, that's why its economy collapsed. So at this stage, I think the world needs to show some mercy towards the Afghan population where one in three children are dying of or, or they are suffering from the food shortages and they are suffering from all uh, the humanitarian crisis so i think all they right, have to Dr. show Farana, what can be it. done what can be done by the world in order to make afghanistan self reliant because you yourself said that uh, uh, afghanistan has been relying on foreign aid in the last few decades so what needs to be done now yep. so that they can stand on their own two feet and not rely on uh, the help from the other countries yeah, I think so. At this stage, uh, the world has to recognize that democracy has failed in Afghanistan. And no matter if we agree or we, di we disagree, Taliban are the leaders of the of the um, of the world now of Afghanistan now. So in this entire game, they have to let them form a government based on uh, uh, their inclusivity and everything. And it's time instead of speaking about stuff, it's time to show some action. So the world has to provide assistance to them in the form of releasing the funds that are that belong to the people of Afghanistan, the $9 billion. And they have to release those funds. And at the same time, the world has to show some kind of sympathy towards the people who are really suffering and, and literally dying of the situation. Um, right, I Dr. also Dr. learned Dr. Faranaz, about that... Dr. Faranaz, what I, I understand that the world needs to do a lot, but do you feel that the world understands the fact that no. Afghanistan is a shared responsibility? They are not understanding it, that it is a shared responsibility where the Afghan uh, peace and the, and, and, and the life, the survival of the Afghan population is completely dependent on all other regional states. And it's not only the region, it is all the powerful states who has the stakes involved in Afghanistan. So at the moment, if like we were learning about that Afghanistan need one billion dollars to import wheat from, um, uh, from, from other countries, but now there is another, from 47% of shortage, there is another uh, rise in that. So they will be needing another billion of dollars to import wheat. If they don't have the money from where they're going to get the food. So True. I think this, all the proponents of the human rights, the United Nations, 
they all have to come together and to work towards an, an emergency measures to, uh, to, 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 you know, to improve the life of the Afghan population. And I think without collective actions, it's not going to happen. They oh, have like you to talk, realize you talk it. of collective action, Dr. Faranaz, uh, the fact remains that there are a lot of fears and apprehensions inside of Afghanistan that they feel that the world is going to abandon it in the next few weeks and months. Do you agree? Looks like that something really bizarre is happening, that despite when the Western powers, when the United Nations and all of those powerful organizations who believe that they, ha they have to work towards providing humanitarian assistance to all those states and people who are really affected due to war or different situations, but if they are not extending their help and support, maybe there is some hidden agenda. Maybe they are torturing them to another extreme where they are not, you know, uh, letting them live even, where children, women, men, everybody is really uh, affected with it. So they probably are moving towards abandoning it, or it could be some other hidden agenda that we have to find within time. The U.S. government's blocking of the $9 billion U.S. dollars of the Afghan Bank Central Reserves and many donors and organizations also that have blocked aid to Afghanistan. Uh, does that need to change in the very near future? Because you yourself said it's not just wheat that we, they need, they also need the money to buy that wheat and the other products. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the thing is that um, I think this the, the holding back this money, which belongs to the people of Afghanistan, I think this is one of the major steps that can either let the Afghans live their life or maybe uh, move them or push them towards, you know, to get over with their lives. So it's a very sensitive issue. Hmm. It's the issue where, where the United Nations where all the proponents of human rights and democracy and basic fundamental rights have to come up and to, sub and, and to show their support. But as I said, the, as, as if for now, they are not coming out to help and, and, and show their, their kindness and support towards the Afghan population, there, should, there is some hidden agenda. Where if we go back to the history of wars, what happened in the World War when Germany was defeated, Germany was made to pay the reparations. So, uh, in this situation, when America, uh, you know, failed in Afghanistan, they are also supposed to pay to do the same act as they made Germany to pay the price for it. So if they are not doing it, this means that they are really violating the international uh, code of jurisdiction. Is there some new law order that they are setting up that if the, the rule will be applied, the international legal system will be applied one way on, on one state and another way on another state? So I think this all together is leading towards a bizarre situation where the Western powers are, I think, losing their grip in terms of democracy, in terms of human rights, in, in terms of humanitarian assistance. They have to get sensitive towards the Afghan population. And I of think course, this, they, this have, to up game, they have to be very sensitive, as you yourself said, Dr. Faranaz. In all of this context, how important is the role of other organizations, such as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, such as the ASEAN, such as... Uh, uh, the OIC, whose extraordinary meeting of foreign ministers is being held on the 19th of this month just to discuss this very matter, Afghanistan. I think all, as I mentioned, that it's all those important organizations who can play their due share, their due role in providing the basic um, support and, and the facilitation to the Afghan population to overcome the humanitarian crisis, crisis is crucial. And I think the entire world and all these organizations are becoming very insensitive towards the people of Afghanistan. It's not the rivalry between Taliban and the West. They're the people are paying the price to it and nobody is getting this joke that the, why are the people paying the price to it where they have nothing to do. They have been a target of all of this situation for years and years and for decades and decades and once now when they when the western power was failing here even now they are reaping the consequences so i would say if we compare the the, the previous democratic government to, to the recent taliban regime even in the previous government it was not based on inclusivity so what is actually is happening not even the now speaking States, of inclusivity not... uh, dr faranaz there are some preconditions that, is, that the west has put to afghanistan and the afghan government in order to uh, uh, release this aid or this funding uh, to uh, the country that is of course embroiled in an economic and humanitarian crisis do you feel that the afghan taliban or the afghan government will comply i think uh, the compliance to all those conditions is all based upon the trust elements between the Afghan population and the Taliban and the West. So there is a the mistrust prevailing among all of them. And uh, the issue is 
what the people of Afghanistan want in this situation. Are they ready to, to hand over the funds to the Taliban? Are they accepting them as their leaders or not? So I think this recognition of Taliban as the leaders of Afghanistan is the major hindrance in, in, in you know, overcoming all the difficulties that Afghanistan and its people is facing today. So, so do you, the do you feel that, that includes, uh, I mean, that acceptance will come or not? And also the fact that it is also being uh, demanded of the Afghan Taliban to have an inclusive government. Will we see more of that inclusivity in the future? I think the Taliban have to show uh, some kind of sensitivity to Brazil because without inclusivity, the, the world is not going to recognize them. The region is not going to recognize them. And the people of Afghanistan probably will not be ready to recognize them. So it's time to think about the survival of Afghanistan and its people rather than thinking about what, what is good and what is bad in, in terms of the Taliban and in the West. So let's come to uh, a consensus where the, the, the basic demands of each one of the parties involved could be met so at least the people of Afghanistan can breathe and they can live. And, and over, I always raise this concern that what would they do with, with all those, you know, um, powerful positions and all if the people are not there to, to live there in Afghanistan, right? If they, if they die of hunger, of famine and all those issues, what will they be doing there? The West cannot achieve their goals. But as I said earlier, when we started it, that probably there is some hidden agenda. Probably the West and its powerful states, they are trying to abandon Afghanistan and to bring them to certain terms, which are yet not uh, you but know, Dr. announced Farana, in, before in public. The, uh, before the Afghan Taliban's government accepts those terms, don't you feel that scores of Afghans will die of starvation, of, uh, uh, of uh, this uh, coal that has engulfed Afghanistan? Don't you feel it has become a dire need, an emergency need? Uh, yes. For the entire world to act as one, at least, at least to help those who are in need, to provide them with food, to provide them with assistance, to provide them with the necessary clothing, and to provide them with the money so that they can buy necessary products. Yeah, I completely agree. It's going to be collective measures, but whenever such kind of catastrophe happened in any part of the world where war is involved, it's not if it's not a natural calamity. So the world has remained very insensitive towards the overall population. We have seen what's happening in Iraq. We have seen what happened in other Middle Eastern countries. So nobody care about if people are dying or not. But this is not acceptable. This is 21st century. This is 2021. And so it, we have to change the narratives. We have to change our approaches towards, uh, you know, the politics and global politics. If we continue this way, people are dying every now and then. And 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 I think then we if we we let it. Happen, happen, then we have to bring changes in the international code of conduct. We have to bring changes in the legal system that prevails at international level. Then we cannot demand and say that if we are doing this to the mankind and at the same time we believe in human rights and fundamental rights and this and that, that does not make sense. That does not right, make Paragas, sense. There's also another apprehension. That apprehension is, is that if we do not help Afghanistan in due time with the, their basic needs at least, there will be a, an increase in internal turmoil and terrorism is, uh, at that as well. That is going to trickle out, out of Afghanistan into the neighboring countries. What's your take on that? I think uh, it will lead to this refugee crisis as well. It will lead to with several extremism cases as well. So I think it's time to stop it right, right over there rather than waiting for the moment where the issue is or the genie is out of the box. So let's keep the genie in the bottle and uh, yeah. we, we we try to work collectively towards overcoming the issue. And I think the regional states and the neighboring states have to play a due role and due share in controlling uh, the situation where Afghan and if population and Afghan people, they are really, really getting affected with that. I, that think is, I totally I agree with you on that. Dr. Faranaz, the world needs to share the, collect the responsibility collectively as far as Afghanistan is concerned. Afghanistan is in dire needs of food, of shelter, of the necessary uh, requirements that are the need of the day for our neighboring country so that it can survive the next months. And if the world does not come as one to help it, the consequences are going to be extremely dire, not only for Afghanistan, but for the region and the world in general. Thank you very much, Dr. Faranas, to have joined us, to have talked to us about 
uh, humanitarian aid that Pakistan is providing to Afghanistan, has been providing to Afghanistan, and all the pledges that Pakistan has been making, including the, uh, the about to be held emergency meeting, exceptional meeting of the foreign ministers of the OIC to discuss one, a one point agenda, and that is Afghanistan. Thank you very much, Dr. Faranas. And now let's come to our second segment, ladies and gentlemen, that concerns economy. Interest rate hits a 20-month high, despite the fact the State Bank of Pakistan says that uh, the inflation and the current account deficit are going to remain elevated. How is all of that going to affect the common man? What is co uh, the current account deficit and inflation? And does a common man, a youngster, or even those who are retired and have fixed deposits inside their banks, uh, will they be affected by the measures that the government is taking, uh, whether it be the T-bills or whether it be the other uh, measures? We've been joined uh, to talk about that and more in the studios by Saddam Hussein. He's an economist, and uh, we also uh, we've been uh, will be joined by uh, online by Riba Shahid, who's an economic journalist. But let's begin with uh, Saddam Hussein, who is in the studios with us. Saddam, thank, thank you. you very much to have joined us. So, down the measures taken by the government, are these unpopular in your point of view? And do you feel that the boom-bust cycle that was uh, that happened in 2018 uh, could or should be repeated because uh, the current account deficit had increased at that point? I guess uh, the, 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 you started with the inflation and the state bank hmm. announcement of the increased rate. Uh, the increase in interest rate. Uh, we at PIDE recently launched a report uh, named as PIDE Analytics Inflation in that we clearly explained that inflation, uh, because the biggest issue uh, at present is inflation. Of course. So uh, the, uh, inflation in Pakistan is a broad-based phenomenon. It is not coming from a single source. It mm. is coming from the supply side. Of it course. is coming from the demand side. Mm. It is coming from the international energy prices and international food prices. So if we have one source for inflation, we could have controlled it by a single instrument or a single tool, for example, mm. the interest rate management by the state bank. But that's not the case. Mm. So what options do we have? Or did we have, uh, we could have controlled the inflation by, for example, uh, by controlling the food inflation. Mm. But that can be controlled either if we increase the food supply or mm. increase the energy supply, which is pr pretty much difficult. Uh, secondly, uh, we could either um, and, and we could wait for the international food prices to slash down and international energy prices, which is again beyond our control. Mm. Uh, second option, uh, which we had, is to appreciate the foreign exchange reserves, uh, so that we could control the import uh, side of inflation. Uh, but for that, we need foreign exchange reserves, which we do not have, and which economically it is not advisable. Third is that we could. Uh, have controlled inflation by slashing the oil prices through the tax cut. Mm. We, obviously, we have to pay for the oil prices, but we can reduce the tax on the oil. Mm. But if we do that, uh, we could control a bit of inflation, but we can, would squeeze our fiscal space. You know, we don't. We would have the government would not have any money to spend on uh, things. So what State Bank has done is kind of a, a right uh, step in the right uh, d direction, but its impact is not very significant. It mm. will only yeah. Oh, I don't know. It will only what? It will be? only curtail the demand side inflation, which is a small factor in overall inflation mm. equation. So, in the coming months, it may release the pressure from the demand side inflation, but overall impact is very uh, minimal. All right. Now, uh, you know, uh, our banks, because there is a lot of apprehension by the common man taking advantage of this current situation in your point of view. Um, I don't understand. In what sense? Uh, uh, for example, the uh, for, uh, the policy guidance, the for forward policy guidance that has been uh, given by the SPB, uh, because this is going to, is it going to help the businessmen? Is it going to help the banks? Will the banks take advantage of this one way or the other or not? What's your take on that? I guess there's a, uh, an issue of consistency mm. and uh, unanticipatedness. Mm. The uh, monetary policy should always be uncertain and unanticipated. So when it is announced, it can have an impact. Mm. But now, uh, we kind of predict what state, is, state bank is going to do. Okay. So the banks and other sectors, they already absorb the impact. So mm. when it is announced, the net impact is very min minimal. So All I right. guess that answers your question. All right. Thank you. Uh, Ariba Shahid, economic journalist, also joins us online. Ariba, thank you very much to have joined us. Ariba, current account deficit, inflation, uh, economic policy, these are things that uh, uh, worry a lot of people of different ages, whether they are working or whether they are businessmen or whether they are retired. Should Pakistan be worried? Of 
course, of course, Pakistan should be worried, especially because foreign exchange is so rare in our country. So, of course, Pakistan should be worried. Um, but in terms of long term stability, uh, measures should not just be fixed to bring these up or put these up. So, that's something that is kind of that um, everything that's being done so far is putting up fires. Um, all right. Now, Ariba, uh, uh, the policy rate is currently at 9.75. Do you feel that this will question the debt sustainability of our government? Uh, so, so considering the fact that the government is not able to borrow from the bank and have to borrow from the banks, um, first bank uh, of course, this puts a lot of pressure on the government. Uh, but at the same time, the policy is not seen through the lens of debt, seen through the lens of all right, all right. Uh, Saddam, uh, how can, in your point of view, the State Bank of Pakistan and the Finance Division work to keep this growth rate sustainable? Um, I guess it's a big question. It is not uh, the domain of only State Bank. Yes. There has to be, uh, there doesn't have to be compartmentalized approach. Mm. All the sector and all the organizations should can work together and should work together. Mm. The State Bank has a small role, role to play. Uh, what state bank can do, as I mentioned earlier, it should uh, make its with, uh, policies consistent in a way uh, that you know it can um, adjust with the, uh, the, the needs of the time. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it should be as uncertain as and I shouldn't say uncertain, but unanticipated, so that the the impact, the people which it will impact, they cannot absorb the shock. Mm. So when we know what the state bank going to do, we already set our equations and set our structures and all of that according to the anticipated mm. exchange rate. So when it is announced, we already know and we have already adjusted to the announced rate. So what state bank intends to do, the effect is zero. So I guess state bank should work a bit on that. All right. Now, uh, speaking of borrowing from the market, what should be the policy of the government or the state bank of Pakistan as far as that is concerned? Is also how can one tighten the monetary policy? Uh, tightening monetary policy and not tightening is a is a debate. But the borrowing, what this interest rate will mm. do, this will uh, you know make the borrowing, the government borrowing from the banks uh, a bit expensive which is also an issue which will come in the, in the in coming months. But for till then, the other inflation uh, equation, uh, factors in the equation of inflation will drop down. And the government, uh, in the, the, the expensive borrowing of the government from the banks will uh, be a single issue in the equation. So I guess in coming months, that will be an issue. But till then, the other factors will drop down. And the net effect inflation will be dropped down to the uh, but again, in the report, in part inflation analytics report, we have uh, predicted that the inflation will remain between 10 to 10.5 in right. 2022 and 11 to 11.5 in the first half and till the second half of 2023. It will come to the single digit in the year 2024. All right. And it is... Despite, I mean, if, yeah. if everything goes on as smooth yeah, as it is. Uh, obviously, assumptions mm. are always there in economic right. modeling and estimates. Mm -hmm. But these rates are much higher, are higher than the other mm. estimates from the State Bank and World Bank and IMF. But we are pretty, pretty confident with these numbers. All right. Ariba, uh, in this current uh, situation, uh, that Pakistan is embroiled in, how uh, should uh, the government, the State Bank of Pakistan, the Finance Division and the other uh, stakeholders ensure that market volatility does not recur? All right, so market volatility in the stock market is something that, you know, the government shouldn't really care about uh, as aggressively as it does sometimes. But the volatility in the, um, uh, the debt market in terms of bond yields, uh, Use, that is something the government should ensure through clear, concise communication, which does not let people panic, and also through right debt management in the sense that, you know, you, you at one point you don't reject bids and then later on you accept them at a really high rate, thus ensuring panic. So the, the debt department needs to give out right signaling and the government needs to give out some sense of confidence and the forward guidance given by the, the state bank itself helps calm down the market. So so if you notice the PSX today, the PSX is responding to the fact that they were expecting an aggressive rate hike and they got a normal rate hike in comparison. And that is why the market is celebrating it. 
So the volatility in the market can only go away through concise and clear communication and what the long-term goal is. And the very fact that the, the state bank identified a long-term goal in yesterday's statement, you know, uh, is, is, it has been seen by the, the markets in the auction today and as well as in the PFX today. Your point of view, uh, the policy rate that is at 9.75 as we speak, should there be an orderly spread between this policy rate and the T-bills? Do you feel this is the need of the day or the need of the hour? Uh, the spread, the, 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 the heating up in the spread has calmed down significantly. Uh, the last auction that we had, uh, that showed that there was very bullish behavior. Uh, it, it's calmed down and the markets are, you know, is normaling out there they're normalizing they're stabilizing so so it's the need of the hour in the sense that the the policy rate uh, is, is not too high in pakistan standards uh, if you compare it to the past so it's okay the market's quite used to having such a policy rate all right uh, let's come back to saddam saddam uh, when it comes to economic growth uh, people talk that uh, uh, in order for the economic growth to remain uh, robust, there are certain parameters, and they include electricity generation, cement dispatches, sales of fast-moving consumer goods, petroleum products, and persistent uptrend, uptrend in imports and tax revenues. How much of that has been achieved so far by the government, and how much of that can further be achieved in the days of come? Do you feel the reaction from the market, from the businessmen, from the normal community in Pakistan is sufficient? Um, in the start, when the government came, um, there was a sincere intent to to uh, focus on all these areas. But with the time, um, the, it, it draws it draw down. Uh, what it need? What is the need of the time is to increase the real productivity, hmm. which is a bit difficult for Pakistan. You know, for industrialization and all that, so of that course. we can increase our exports and manufacturing. It it takes time. But what we can do uh, presently which d d doesn't cost a single penny is deregulation privatization and remove the sludge you know the the documentation you know if you want to go to the uh, you want to buy a plot you have to one window operation steps, basically so, yeah mm. so we call it a sludge so remove mm. the sludge uh, uh, simplify the processes mm. and deregulate things you know there's hundreds of regulation on single things so uh, going through all that it slow down the economic growth. Mm. So we at present, if we have a s limited fiscal space and no money, at least we can do that. We can involve the private sector to privatize things uh, which are uh, going in uh, a loss. We could do deregulate so that we can encourage the business because the business is um, hesitant in, in, in plunging into the economic activity because there are a hell of, a hell of regulations. And then to decode these regulations and to to set your uh, target and approach mm. is very difficult. And uh, thirdly, as you said, simplify the processes. Mm. So at least we can do that. But I don't think uh, what is the focus of the government, uh, uh, obviously there is a lot of r resistance and status quo and other things. It's not an easy thing to do, but at least we can take a start. All right. So in some areas we can see a bit of start, a bit of reform, but uh, it should be consolidated and strengthened. All right. You talked about time. the inflation rate, uh, Saddam. I'd like to understand. It has risen on a month-to-month -month basis uh, of uh, by around 3%. Yes. And uh, in November, it was on a 21-month uh, high of 11.5%, yeah. if I'm not wrong. And you said that in the coming uh, months, till 2024, this inflation rate is either going to remain at the same or increase to a little bit. Increase to uh, incre uh -huh. Yes. So, uh, uh, what are the factors that lead to this, ha that have led to this constant increase in the inflation rate and as you said, will not lead to a decrease till 2024? Yeah. Again, the same uh, factors. For example, if I take one, the exchange rate, uh, we need the foreign reserves. And where are the foreign reserves? It will only come if we increase our pr economic hmm. productivity hmm. and increase our exports. So that's not a gonna, that's not going to happen in mm. like two years mm. so for the same reason that I explained ab above uh, it will be difficult uh, since for mm. two to three years to mm. uh, attain mm. those uh, uh, targets mm. so uh, but f to kill the infl inflationary uh, expectations and kill the demand side and then there's an expectation that the oil prices will come down and mm. commodity prices will come down so uh, for that for all those factors we estimated that in 2024, it will only come to the uh, single-digit right. inflation well, rate. All right. That, that's an interesting point. And I'm going to come back to you. But Ariba, my last question to you is, let's come to the current account deficit. Uh, 
It has sharply risen this year due to an increase in imports. And the State Bank of Pakistan says that these increase in imports is because the of the fact that we need products that are not available in Pakistan. Now, the inward shipments have also risen to 32.9 billion during July to November 2021. Uh, how, uh, what measures, what instant measures in your point need to be taken by all the sectors involved? All right. So, so primarily, uh, if we look at the, the current account deficit, one reason for the decline is also because uh, our remittances haven't been going the same way and, you know, our remittances are going to flatten out uh, after a spectacular year last year. So there's one, one reason for that. Um, in, in terms of all the sectors, uh, we need to realize that a lot of our sectors, in order for them to achieve growth, they need to increase their imports as well. Uh, the auto sector is just one example of that. So we may incur a greater deficit for a longer time if these sectors are to improve and eventually become exporters. So that is something that the government needs to understand or, you know, uh, make a stance on. Uh, but as far as the sectors are concerned, being more competitive, uh, exploring different markets is something that they need to do uh, because the number of markets that Pakistan is able to tap into is, is very small. Um, so there's that. Uh, but yeah, right now the current account deficit isn't really supported by remittances the same way it was uh, probably a few months ago. But in your point of view, uh, just an extension of this question, how long could it take for a country like Pakistan to start building uh, on its own and to rely more uh, less on the imports? You know, to be very honest, these changes don't come overnight. Uh, they, they, take, they take time, they take dedicated effort, and also they, they, they require a dedicated environment. Um, so, you know, within, if, 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 if the work gets put in right now, we could see made in Pakistan, exported from Pakistan, becoming a reality within the next two or three years as well, if we're talking about some products. And then for, for large-scale projects, maybe four to five years, because we are starting localized production of, let's say, mobile phones, cars, etc., things that we didn't really do in the past. So, so there is hope. It's not, it's not bleak. It's just, you know, the right priorities. Thank you very much, Ariba, to have joined us and to have talked to us uh, uh, in detail about uh, the current economic situation in Pakistan. Coming to you, Saddam, and again, my last question to you. Uh, current account deficit, inflation, we've discussed in detail. The economic growth in the country, we've discussed in detail. The role of uh, uh, the banking sector, of the State Bank of Pakistan, of the businessmen, of the government, of the finance division. You said it's a collective responsibility. It's not just the responsibility of one institution or two or three. But what is the need, what do you feel are the two or three factors that would make our economy sustainable, stable, and as you said, in, by 2024, we might come to a single uh, rate inflation, single digit inflation. Yeah, maybe. single digit inflation. Uh, first of all, we need to sit together, uh, the, all the organization and institute and ministries, and there should be a clear roadmap and, and a coordinated, coordinated roadmap that what each has the part to play. Uh, secondly, uh, there should be a consistent roadmap. You know, you cannot do one thing and after three months and six months change the roadmap and other person came and he has another plan. So I guess the Pakistan issue largely has been consistency. If we remain consistent in our policies, in our approach, then we will start somewhere. And then there's another story after the start. All right. So you mean to say that good governance is the need of the yeah. R and the need and also it's important for all the uh, stakeholders to jointly work together to evolve a uh, common strategy yeah. that would work towards strengthening our economic situation. Yes. And of course, uh, inflation rate or current yeah. deficit and so on and so forth to make our economy stronger. Thank you yeah, very much, Saddam Hussain, to have joined us in the studios. And ladies and gentlemen, of course, as you understand, and I've tried to uh, simplify things for you, the current account deficit or the inflation rate or economic growth are more or less intertwined. But what needs to be done is that the, uh, all the sectors that are involved in uh, economic stability, economic sustainability, need to understand uh, that it is uh, extremely pertinent to work together for a joint cause, and that is the future of Pakistan. Let's come to our third segment, ladies and gentlemen, and that concerns, uh, of course, uh, Sri Lanka, where Arjuna Ranatunga 
who is a former cricketer, has thanked our Prime Minister for the efforts to ensure justice for our Priyanta Kumara. Now, uh, Sri Lanka's uh, former cricketer, who, was, who is a legend himself, turned politician, uh, he thanked our Premier for his efforts to find all those involved in the lynching of the Sri Lankan manager in Sialkut earlier this month and his support also for the deceased family. As you very well know, that our government and our people have stood together as far as condemning this heinous incident is concerned and also uh, we're trying to put the people behind it at task. As uh, you also know that uh, cases have been registered against 900 workers of the Rajko Industries and uh, also others under different sections of the Pakistan Penal Code and the Anti-Terrorism Act as well and scores have been arrested in the following days. Uh, inshallah, uh, justice uh, will be served to those who have been behind this and Pakistan and Pakistanis will stand solidly behind their Sri Lankan brothers. Let's come to our next story and that concerns Omicron, ladies and gentlemen. As you very well know that this is the latest variant of uh, uh, the pandemic that is COVID-19 uh, came from, I mean, in, emerged in South Africa and since then has uh, gone across the globe. There are extreme uh, uh, cautions and measures that have been taken by different countries across the world, including the United Kingdom, where the number of cases has increased. Uh, and also in China, where uh, these cases of Omicron have uh, also been found in different travelers that have reached, and not just now, but about two weeks after that. What needs to be seen is how uh, virulent, how aggressive uh, this uh, form of uh, COVID-19, that is Omicron, is. Will it uh, result in as many deaths as were in the case with the Delta and the Delta Plus variants? Only time will tell. Nevertheless, as uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, doctors and specialists are saying what we need to do first and for foremost is to follow the standard operating procedures because uh, the vaccinated or even those who received the booster vaccines, there are some uh, who have gotten the Omicron despite having that. So the, there is a main crux that is and that uh, remains to be done is to follow the standard operating procedures and we've been talking about that over the last couple of months and in fact more than a year about what needs to be done and I hope that you understand is that that message has gotten across because in Pakistan also we have now a case of Omicron. We don't know what's going to happen in the coming days as far as the number of cases and how that's going to increase. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, let's go to the United States of America and their uh, Republican representative Lauren Boebert who had cracked a racist and Islamophobic joke about Democratic representative Ilhan Omar in the U.S. House of Representatives. Not the first time that she did something of that, not the only person that who has done something like that, but the U.S. House of Representatives has taken a swift action as far as that. A formal step of a response, a 219 to 212 party line vote to approve legislation sponsored by Ilhan Omar that would establish a new special envoy position at the State Department to monitor and combat Islamophobia worldwide. Now, uh, what needs to be seen is whether it will be eventually passed by the Senate or not. Nevertheless, there are uh, certain questions also about this legislation that has been brought forward very, very quickly. So, uh, nevertheless, it's an important step in the right direction. Islamophobia is something that is plaguing the world and all the countries should be united in, uh, in condemning it and in taking our legislation against it. With that, we come to an end of today's newsroom. We'll see you, inshallah, tomorrow with new segments and stories. Stay tuned, stay safe. Get vaccinated and follow the SOPs. Allah Hafiz.